Good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Siegel, a lecturer at the Graduate School of Business. It is my great pleasure to spend this evening with you tonight talking with Dan Schwartz. Dan is the Dean of the Graduate School of Education, and he's the Nomalini Olivier Professor of Educational Technology. Uh, he's been a member of the Stanford School of Education faculty since 2000. He actually studies understanding and representation and the ways that technology can facilitate learning. He works at the intersection of cognitive science, computer science, and education, and he looks at how cognition and instruction shapes individuals, cross cultures, and also in technological settings. Dan, welcome to the Graduate School of Business and our class on business and society. Good to see you, Rob, and everybody else that I can't see. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do to get us started is I'm gonna just share a couple of slides to uh, help set the tone. And so I'm just gonna do this briefly. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. We are living in strange times with COVID. And what we have found is that the number of people being impacted on an educational standpoint is absolutely staggering. According to UNESCO, over 1.4 billion people are being impacted right now in their educational studies because of COVID and because of the coronavirus. In fact, if we look at World Economic Forum, they said that it's up to a billion people cannot go to school or universities as the uh, society stops to try to spread of COVID-19. It's interesting to see the different ways that organizations and countries are trying to handle how to deal with education, educating our population. If you look at this particular chart, it's kind of interesting. It's very much impacted by the wealth of countries, counties, and even cities. And you see that where there is increased wealth on the right side of this picture, people use increasingly online mediums like we're using here, but in very, very poor settings, maybe they're using TV and radio and a little bit of online. It's a real challenge. And the question is, is this going to be a way that we change education on a national and global basis? Let me give you two perspectives. One from the uh, former Secretary of Education in Massachusetts said the following. In this situation, we don't simply want to frantically struggle to restore the status quo because the status quo wasn't operating at an effective level and certainly wasn't serving all of our children fairly. A different perspective, somebody you all know if you're from the Graduate School of Business quite well, Professor Jeff Pfeffer talked about the fact that he said a bunch of business schools are going to go out of business. And in fact, he said he's less optimistic that there will be change, particularly the top business schools. I don't see a big move to online, Professor Pfeffer said. People want the in-person experience. And when we think about the in-person experience at, at you know, graduate level, uh, and especially professional institutions, the networking and the personal experience is a very, very big thing that people, part of the reason they actually go to get their education, not only what you learn in the classroom, but what you learn from each other. I wanna highlight a few topics that I want us to consider tonight while we go through uh, our discussion with Dan. First, what's gonna be the economic impact of the pandemic on education? And Dan and I, as we were presenting, uh, preparing for this, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we're headed to a very deep global recession and how's that gonna impact funding for education? What's gonna be the socioeconomic impact of this? Education plays a very big role in our operating rhythm as society. Children going to school, parents going to work, and how will that change if children can't be going to school on the same rhythms that they used to? What's gonna happen in urban and suburban settings, both for schools and for universities? Will one be advantaged and will one be disadvantaged? Where will technology help and where can it not help? Where can it serve as a substitute for what we can't do anymore? Where can technology serve as an augmentation? And where can it serve as an expansion, both to increase our reach and possibly our selectivity of whom we educate and how we educate them? What are gonna be the skill sets required for instructors? How will instructors be effective in a virtual medium if they can't be in front of the classroom? What's the flow of classes gonna be of multiple generations of people? Will students take gap years? Will students take leave of absences? Will people fall behind and how will we catch them up? And then finally, what's gonna be the impact of globalization and international students? All of these things we're gonna talk about tonight with Dan. We're gonna break our discussion into three parts. For the first part, we're going to talk about K through 12 education, primary and secondary, where I know Dan has spent a lot of his time. Second, we're going to shift to be talking about higher education and universities. And finally, we're going to do a session on what I call optimism versus pessimism, 
Is this going to be a Sputnik moment? Is this going to allow us to do something great and wonderful? Or are we just going to get more of the same? So Dan, let's start for a moment. And a simple question, let's start first with K through 12. Tell me a little bit about what do you think is going to be transformed from this pandemic? And will it be transformed in a big way or a small way and why? So uh, I think one thing that's being transformed by the pandemic is, uh, and this isn't, this isn't exactly the answer you're fishing for, but uh, schools do, uh, for all their flaws, schools do a lot for equity. And now that people aren't able to go to school, you suddenly begin to see it, where uh, the, all these children aren't having the opportunities and their families are struggling. And so the big question for me is after the economic collapse of the tax base for schools, will people remember how important schools were and decide to invest in them? Or will it, it just come back? So for example, uh, right now, it, it looks like most schools are gonna open a couple days a week for a particular grade. So you, you're, you're in first grade, you go on Monday and Wednesday. You're in second grade, you go on Tuesday and Thursday. It's a great way to get social distancing. And, and so the question is, will people think everything's okay now? Because it's all fixed, because we're going back to school. Or will they realize sort of how bad it is for some people in this situation? And so I think that has a lot to do with whether the future is going to be different, is whether this maintains mind share over a couple of years. What will have to be done to maintain that mind share? What will it take for countries and communities and for individuals to change the way we think about education because of this? Uh, go to the ballot box, realize that the taxes help, uh, begin to see what's around you. You know, I, I, it's, it's money. Well, it's interesting. When we were talking earlier, we talked about what comes first, income inequality or educational inequality. What right. do you think drives that? Well, I don't, I don't think education solves economic inequality. It's too big of a lift. Uh, but what education does is where there's economic or close to economic equality, it, then it has its big effects. You know, so, but, so the amount of money spent per student in Palo Alto compared to Redwood City is like a five-fold difference, right? And that, that's the, so the income inequality suffuses the schools. When we talked about this, this particularly in California where education is funded by the tax base on property taxes, uh, property taxes end up adva giving advantages to wealthier communities. But do you actually foresee a world where you might see those education dollars spread out more evenly? Yeah, so they, they uh, it's very hard to do. You know, education is incredibly decentralized. Even in countries where it's a national curriculum, it's incredibly decentralized. So, you know, the feds don't put in a tremendous amount of money into education compared to the states. So in California, you know, they try and do this. They, they have uh, formulas for how much the state will give different school districts. It tries to make it uh, balance it out, you know. But anyway, you know, I think one of the keys to the recovery uh, and how it evolves is, is money and whether people are willing to spend the money to fix things. So, so that's one. And so you think of Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, it, it had to get hundreds of thousands of computers to children, right? So it could do online. And uh, philanthropy stepped up. Businesses stepped up. They all got those computers out to those kids. It's sort of amazing. So now, two years from now, when the computers stop working, is somebody going to infuse the money again to keep them going? And so, so there's a money question. The other side, which is a little more uh, peppy, is you know if, if people come up with simple, effective things to do, uh, they'll get adopted. So what, one thing that one of my favorite stories is. Uh, uh, Preschool teachers or elementary school teachers now uh, try and in some school districts, right? Every school district is different. Every school within a school district is different. But uh, in one, the school teachers have a five minute one-on-one -on -one video chat with their student. And this is a big deal for the kids. The kids like get dressed up to have this conversation with their teacher, you know, and the teachers uh, a one shot in a movie. It's a big phase close there. And the teacher begins to see what's going on in the children's household and family. 
And I think this makes a big difference. I think it's an easy thing to do. It's sort of like YouTube. You know, YouTube is the number one used technology in schools. It's just, it's easy to use, it solves a problem. So maybe we'll get a bunch of those, you know, that'll really make, make it easy to do incremental changes like that. I want to go back to something you said earlier. I'm imagining for the next 12 months, let's say certain students go to school on Mondays and Wednesdays and other kids on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we've talked about the operating rhythm of our society. And I see it even here with the Stanford faculty, my colleagues who have young children. If you have two working parents uh, and, and you're having to homeschool a young child, the impact that that's having on the parents, on their work and their ability to do their work, and then also to educate their child. How do you see this pandemic changing that dynamic? And will that actually help or hurt the children? Or do you think that will get people and the adults to focus more on, we really need to solve some of our educational challenges? So Bob, I, I, I hate to admit this, but I missed the first half of your question. <laughs> uh, so that'll teach me to use someone else's house. Um, so is the question, uh, you know, child care, school plays a big role in child care and it's gone away. Exactly. And so we yeah. see particular parents with young children are having to do not only their jobs, but also have to help educate their children and actually look after their children. And for example, my wife and I, our children are older. When I compare my colleagues on the GSB faculty who have young kids, I'm watching how it's a much more difficult and challenging time for them right now. Yeah, it's sort of unsupportable, right? Uh, I have colleagues who, you know, they're on a block schedule. I take the kids from 9 a.m. to 1 and then I work from 1 to 5. You know, I, 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 one, here's one possibility. Let, let's say this stays on for a while, that uh, employers say, gee, maybe the work week should only be 20 hours, right? It's, and I'd be happy with that. I, I would really be happy if I only worked 20 hours, you know? And you, I would say, Will they pay people the same amount for the, what they paid for 40 to 50 hours versus uh, what they did for uh, 20 hours? No, probably not. Probably not even if they were equally efficient. You know, they do people, there are studies that say, you know, you work from home, you get more done. So maybe, maybe uh, but I, I suspect not. I suspect industry is not going to step up to solve the daycare problem like that. They're, they're going to have to do something, right? If, if, the school, if, the, if the schools can't do it and the employers need employees, something's got something's to give. So you talked about how uh, teachers, in particular in K through 12, are getting their five minutes with students and actually seeing into the homes and seeing what it's like and they actually get a, a more personal contact with each individual student. Are you finding that the faculty are able to change the way they're teaching and how they're doing it in this medium or are they simply automating what they were doing before? Uh, boy, you mean faculty, you mean the K-12 K through teachers. 12. Correct. Right. We'll, we'll get to higher uh, education in a moment. No, you know, it, it's, they can't automate it because you're so prone to what the technology can do. So, you know, the big winners in this, besides health insurance, which is keeping all your premiums, the big winner is this, is the uh, companies that have early penetration in the, in the education market. So they, they're, they're, they've already penetrated, they've already got some services that are familiar to the teachers. And now the teachers can rely on them more and more and more, right? But in most cases, uh, it's not that way. The teachers are having to use fundamentally new technologies. They're only getting to interact with the kids a little bit. You know, if, if you're teaching K-12, most of the time is spent orchestrating a classroom of kids talking to each other. And so they can't do that anymore. So that it's really a new set of skills. Uh, how, how do I make what used to be a 40 minute lesson five minutes? And then set it up so the kids could be independent learners. And that, that's the challenge for the young kids. They can't do it on their own. Final question on K through 12 before we move to higher education. Socialization is a big part of going to school. Children learn to interact with each other, learn to work out issues and challenges, way to uh, develop friendships. Um, how do you see that changing in a world, let's say for the next few years, if students can't be having that regular operating rhythm of going to school on a regular schedule? How will they get that socialization? Uh, it's inconceivable. Uh, it's the idea that my child will only have friends on the video monitor is inconceivable. Uh, it what just, are the implications I, I of that? I don't think society will, will stand for it. They're willing to take the risk of the disease. 
what do you think the implications of that are for the development of our of our children? So, you know, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. The kids are getting a lot of attention from their parents. And yeah. and and so parents are very good at scaffolding the children, helping them have conversations. Uh, what the parents don't do that kids do to each other is the kids are a little mean to each other, so they learn how to deal with that. You know, and so you develop uh, how to play, how to how to roughhouse without hurting, uh, and and so lots of things like that. So uh, you'll lose a lot. But again, the thought experiment is inconceivable to me. Okay. The, the kids are not going to spend their life in video games, right? So let's shift gears. Let's talk about higher education. Let's talk about K through 12. Let's let me start with a kind of a simple and open-ended question, or a not so simple but open-ended question. What do you see the role is of a university in a university like Stanford? Uh, are, is our job to grow the minds of our students who come in? Are we trying to help them get jobs? What's the purpose of higher education? And does it differ between a private university and a public university? So what, what's your answer? What's my answer? No, you're the yeah, person. No, no, the no. I, hey, 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 who's, who's the dean? What's, you're what's the your dean answer? and I'm just a lecturer. Okay, I actually believe the role of education and in particular a place like Stanford is, let them take the Graduate School of Business. I can teach them product management. I can teach them finance. I can teach them strategy. I also believe I'm supposed to teach the whole student. I think the Jesuits were right. And I'm supposed to teach them about what it means to be a Stanford leader, what it means to be an alum. And my job is to push them in the classroom. We talked about this a little bit in our previous conversation, to challenge their ideas, not give them a monoculture, show them different perspectives so that they can develop their own opinions. Now that's Rob's opinion. I'd like to know what the Dean of the Graduate School of Education thinks. So, so uh, I think it's all those things. I think uh, college, you know, is a period of identity development. Uh, lots of tremendous amount of informal learning. So I think that when people, most uh, education, online education providers uh, really are focusing on a menu of courses. And that's sort of not what's been lost with the pandemic. What's been lost is all the informal identity development, community building, social interaction. So I think it's Stanford's responsibility to figure out how to, how to regain those fundamental functions of a graduate of a college education and to be able to do it online. Any best practices that you've seen that you've been particularly impressed by? Uh, there's lots of good ideas. You know, it, it's funny. The, the number one question I get is can't you tell us what the best practices are for doing online education? It, it's uh, everybody asks me. And the answer is nobody knows, right? And nobody knows. And that's a policy question. This is not a policy problem. This is a design problem. We need to figure out how to design for the kinds of goals we want. Thus far, most online education has not been designing for informal learning. It's been designing for very independent learners to develop academic outcomes and skills in jobs. So, so Stanford's got to figure out how to solve this. Do you think it differs in a place like Stanford versus public schools or, you know, we have a number of universities in our country. Do you think that the, the purpose of these universities varies depending upon who they are and where they are? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, Stanford's a little over the top, right? It, it, no matter what you want to be, you can find it here. It's what you get in a really large, comprehensive university like Stanford. And so if, if you just want to be job ready, you can do that. If you just want to know everybody and be a networker, you can do that. Other schools don't, you know, they're not quite as massive an enterprise. Dan appears to be frozen, but hopefully he's going to come back soon. All right, you're back now, Dan. You froze there. Um, so the last thing we heard was a yeah. um, place like Stanford can, you know, you can be a networker, you can be uh, an expert and get a job, and then you froze. So can you maybe repeat the last part of what you said? Yeah, after uh, that? No, it was good at froze. <laughs> I ran out of ideas. That's why it froze. I just, it, I suddenly had no other thoughts. No, you know, other schools have a more narrow focus. Uh, and so it's going to vary. You know, there are schools which are really liberal arts. Uh, there's job skills schools, you know, and so they, they have very different focus. I think the, the liberal arts side 
is the thing that gets hurt by the pandemic because it, it's slow to develop those kinds of sensibilities and the breadth of knowledge. And you need a lot of social interaction. Skills, you know, uh, you, it's not hard to get uh, skill acquisition. The problem with skill oriented schools is the need, the kinds of skills that people need change, right? So you really want somehow to develop uh, colleges that help make people independent learners so they can keep learning. Do you think a number of these universities and schools are going to go out of business because of this? Why, well, you know, if if your if your main source of income is tuition revenue, like I know a college that's ninety five percent tuition revenue, I don't know what they do. You know, I, I don't know how they last. Uh, may, maybe they get bailed out. Maybe they can go bankrupt. But I, I would expect a, a large number of small schools to close, which will hurt because it'll reduce the number of offerings. I did my undergraduate education at that wonderful university on the other side of the Bay. I paid $750 a semester to attend the University of California at Berkeley. Um, by the way, after I graduated, fire and the wheel were invented two years later. But at any rate, what I'd like to know, Dan, is how are public schools gonna be impacted by this and how might that be different than private schools? Yeah, you know, this, this is a little out of my depth. I don't really know the financing, but I'll make a guess and then everybody can decide whether it passes the sniff test. The, the public schools uh, will be paid for. They'll just have an incredible curtailment. So for example, the community colleges, there's an online community college in the California system. It's fully online. I think that's gonna get cut, right? So it's a, a re reduction of services. I think the private schools will go under. Right, they, they can't just, re if they reduce the services, people stop coming. Does that mean that we are reducing education or all of the fringe benefits that might come along, all the great gyms, all the great dorms that they go back to being a little bit more austere than, than the way they used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago uh, versus what they might be today in some locations? Uh, maybe your courses aren't taught by the people who know the topic the best. You What's get, the long-term implication of that? Well, that's a good question. You know, uh, sort of non-faculty teachers tend to be very good. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're Let's welcome. shift gears. Let's talk about the teachers. What do you think instructors, both tenure line and non-tenure line, how do we need to change what we do in order to be effective, perhaps in a blended environment, which might be with us for a few years, so that we can not only have a rich experience in this setting. But I got to tell you, I miss my students. I had 228 students this quarter and I feel gypped. Like I didn't yeah. get my time with them in the classroom. How do we have to change? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the amazing things about the online experience is that there's two things that I've really noticed. One is you have to be incredibly intentional about everything. Just the scheduling the meetings, you have to be intentional. So I was talking today to uh, uh, an executive at Goldman Sachs, and you know they're all they're all sheltered in, at home as well. And he said he started uh, co spontaneously calling his employees. He just call them up to say how they you know. And their first response is, "Why are you calling me? Am I fired?" And he's just calling up to to not be so regimented to actually get that kind of contact. So so that high intentionality demands uh, some shifting in the way you think about it. Uh, Are you with us, Dan, or are you frozen again? All right, the good news is last time Dan froze, he came back after about 15 seconds. Oh, you're back, awesome, you were frozen again. Um, you talked about, the last thing I heard you say was intentionality, which was good, Goldman Sachs calling people, he's not firing his people, but they're intentional. So you're encouraging us to be intentional with what we do and be well, planned. Well, no, I'm saying, I'm saying that because you have to be so intentional, you're going to start paying attention to all these moves that you took for granted when you teach. Okay. And so that's, that's going to be a lever of change. The second thing that's really astounding, the one you brought up, is the utter lack of feedback. Right? So I'm talking to 132 people. I have no idea what they're doing right now. Are they drinking? Are they, you know, laughing? Are they, you know, writing an op-ed? And, and I, after this is over, I will get an email from you that says, fabulous, Dan. Thank you so much. And that will be the sum total of the feedback. 
So, so that we need to change that so the faculty, A, retain their connections, but B, so they can sort of find out which experiments they try work and which don't. I taught a half quarter course uh, this quarter, class ended, um, and at the end I you know, hit end meeting and everyone disappeared. And I left my office and I went into the kitchen and my wife had been logged in because she was listening to it. So well, that was great. And I'm like, it totally sucked class ended and there were no hugs there were no selfies like they were just all gone right and so there's a big part of this that what makes the experience so rich that we're missing out on right now but, and, and i think it's a non-trivial thing it's a great idea so so you need to have some way for like you walk out of your virtual class and you bump into all the other students and you can debrief a little bit yeah. so I, I was the guy who at parties i was always the last one to leave Right, because at the end of the parties, you know, if, if you're still together, the end of the parties where you make the best connections and, and we lose that, it's truncated so quickly. But, you know, again, I, I, I think these are problems you can solve for once you identify them. Okay. Um, last question on this before I'm going to go to optimism versus pessimism. What do you think are going to be the impacts, in particular higher education, on globalization and international students? I mean, whether or not students can cross borders, you and I are lucky. When we stand in front of our classrooms, a lot of times it's like teaching at the United Nations, right? It's, it's awesome. And so now I'm imagining a world where it's possible that people either won't be able to travel or they will choose not to travel. How do you think that impacts the higher education experience? Uh, for, for a place like Stanford, I think it's a big deal. You know, and so we, we at, the, at the GSE, the Graduate School of Education, you know, we, we kind of have this problem where uh, we have some faculty who are willing to design classes so that students can take them asynchronously. And so, you know, the international students should be able to enroll. But I have a bunch of faculty who don't want to do that. And so what happens to the international students? So again, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to force them to get up at 3.30 in the morning to hear your boring lecture? Really? You know, so again, you're going to have to be super intentional about it and hopefully find solutions. Do you think that faculty will be able to say, I don't want to change, that's it, and they'll still be able to keep doing what they're doing? And especially in a world of, you know, a tenure line experience where people have the ability to kind of keep their job, how much do we need to adjust what we do in order to meet the needs of our students? Yeah, so, so my job, you know, is to keep it in front of the faculty, that this is important. So we're going to offer prizes, innovation and education prizes, sort of publicize it, just so the faculty know this matters. They're, you know, they're all scrambled. They, they all, they all want to teach well. There's, no, there's nobody who walks in and says, I would really like to be a crappy teacher. I'm going to use the same yellow sheets that I lectured from all the time. The guy who's lecturing off his yellow sheets thinks he's doing an amazing job, right? He, he believes that he's great. And if he's not, it's the student's fault. So what we need to do is keep it in front of them that there's, there's ways you can do better and make it really easy to help them. And that, that's kind of the challenge, is to make it really easy. I want to switch to optimism versus pessimism in the context of education and what we're going through now. And I was listening to my friend, uh, Vijay Govindarajan, who's known as Vijay. He teaches at Dartmouth, and he did a seminar last week at Harvard. And he was talking about using remote teaching as to, new ways to create new content, new ways to reach people we couldn't do before. He was talking about the country where he was born in India. And even if they wanted to build a lot of universities to educate their 1.2, 1.3 billion people, it would be cost prohibitive. And now you have the ability to reach out if they had uh, uh, broadband connectivity to educate pe more people. And so he framed it almost a kind of the art of the possible. And I, yet when you and I spoke last time, I asked you what's going to stick. And you said, made the comment, whatever's easy. How do I balance this of kind of like, seeing what's possible with what VG talks about, but you're very sober in reality of what will stick is what's easy. How do we balance these two things? So uh, for a long time, we've been hear hearing about how technology can bring education to scale, right? This, is, uh, this has been an important claim that's been going on for a while. Uh, at the same time, it went to scale without a whole lot of impact, right? So you kind of want to get those two together just, just getting on, you know, lectures on your laptop with multiple choice questions is kind of a base form of education. Mm -hmm. so, so now, because, 
universities that have been residential and really paid attention to much more than uh, typical courses have to figure out how to solve this. There's a lot of hope that you can start doing online things that go to scale, that engage people, not just in memorizing skills and facts, but also help them learn how to learn, right? Which is really the independent learner's the goal, right? So I, I appreciate the, the claim to scale. I hope there'll be a lot of new tools. There are a bunch of places who figured out how to do this pretty well. So Brazil, Brazil like India, kind of has this challenge where it has fairly rural places. And so their solution is they have uh, a couple of teachers who are like rock stars. They're, they're known across the country as being fabulous teachers. And then they teach the class. And then in all the remote classes, there's someone on the ground who does all the face-to-face uh, -face work with the children so that the rock star teacher can get the content out. And then locally, you have people who are not as expert as teachers that they can orchestrate interaction. So there, there's innovative models that are going on. Damn, I'm going to become a rock star. Like I'm going to be on TMZ as, as like, this is possible. Like even at my age, I can be on TMZ and be a rock star. I think we should have the channel. You know, we, we, we could start with Sirius XM, rock star teachers, but then we could, we could uh, <laughs> move to TV. You talked about things that might stick and might not stick. Um, and what's easy would stick. What do you think prevents things from sticking? Is it lack of desire? Is it entrenched institutions and ways of doing things? Why don't we do this? If the whole point of, of education is to teach new things and to be innovative. Okay, I got none of it. I'm really <laughs> sorry. It, I, I don't know why Zoom, why can't Zoom solve this? Where Zoom comes up and it says, nobody can hear you right now. It, it waits till it's over and then it says, your internet connection is unstable. Yeah. So, so you're in a business school, get after them and get them to fix this. I think it's an engineering school problem, but that's just oh, kind of my point. perspective. Okay. <laughs> but I want to come, so the question I asked is why don't things stick? Like you talked about, um, you, you had said that what will stick is what's easy, but yet in a world where we're supposed to be teaching innovation, where we're supposed to be pushing new ideas and discovering new things, what prevents from change? Is it just because institutions don't like to change? Is it constituencies that don't like to change? Why won't things stick if we can do something new and better? Uh, well, but they will. Why, why do you say they won't? Every, if, you, if you're a K-12 teacher and you have a projector, you use YouTube. If you're a college professor and you have a projector, you use PowerPoint. They stuck, right? There's lots of things that stuck. What, what doesn't stick so well is really good ways to help people learn because nobody's really focusing on the, the science of the learning. Uh, okay. They're focusing on engagement. Uh, but but they, small group work, you know, where you work together in small groups. This was actually an invention that came out of the Graduate School of Education and it's used everywhere. So, so they do stick. What, what kind of doesn't stick, I don't think, is the, the idea that I'm gonna architect a whole new kind of school system. So you're gonna come in and someone's gonna say, okay, we should stop having schools that are organized by grade levels, right? And we should stop having schools that have summer vacation. I think those things are very hard to architect. You know, there, there's a lot of daring efforts in that place. Those things are hard. The incremental stuff, YouTube, uh, go, go to Wikipedia, you know, that's easy. So new technologies are easy to use. Structural changes are much, much harder. I think that's right. Okay. Right. And, and it's, it's harder to scale structural changes because they often, they're not like McDonald's, you know, it, it's, they're, they're not franchised. The ones that are franchised that have very, very strict rules, uh, they alienate too many people. Okay, I'm going to do one more question. It's a two-part question, and then I'm going to go to Q&A from our audience. Um, if I could give you a magic wand, and you could use it to change one thing, Right. This is this is this is it, when guests come to my class. It's my silver bullet question. But I'm going to give you a magic wand to do something good. What's the one thing you would change in K through 12, and why would you change it? Send more money. Where would that money come from? Yeah, I don't know. I, it was a magic wand. <laughs> you asked me. It's a magic okay. wand. Right. You think more money solves the problem? I think and, it helps. And, okay, it helps. I think it helps. Similar. So if teachers' salaries were higher, if we respected our teachers because they had higher salaries, 
it would stick longer in the profession. We'd attract increasing talent. You know, it, it, there would be more resources. The kids at home would have resources provided by the schools. You know, and because a lot of learning happens at home and it's hard for the school to reach into home. So I, I can do a lot with money, of course. It's very possible that that money would be wasted, mm -hmm. right? Before I get to my second question, you just said something I want to double click on. I'm going to propose that in some societies, teachers are more highly respected than in others. And that in our society, oftentimes, like we don't, uh, teachers in our country have not been highly respected relative to other professions. Um, why do you think that is? I don't know. It's a great, it's, it's a problem that a lot of us have tried to solve that uh, everybody, uh, parents for the most part, and love the teachers. They love their children's teachers. It's just the rest of teachers that they don't think so highly of. You know, so this, this is a tough problem. We had this, uh, there was a, a Russian oligarch who came and wanted us to help him. He was, he was going to start a new city and he wanted us to help him build schools on the state of the art. And so I'm talking to him and I brought in some of, you know, the thought leaders in the school and they're all talking about uh, how do you set up the school so the teachers want to keep working there, right? And this was the main issue. How do you prevent attrition? I sort of watching him on the other side and I, I interrupted and I said, so if you're a teacher in Russia, do you leave the profession? He said, no, once you're a teacher in Russia, you do it for your whole life. So it's a very different uh, line of respect and profession than we have here. And for me, I fell into it after 27 years of uh, business career. And yeah, so, I, was a... so I've always thought the thing that people don't get about teaching is it's really satisfying, mm -hmm. right? I think, we, I think we market the teaching profession incorrectly. We market I often, it. Yeah, I often say teaching at Stanford's the most uh, rewarding thing I've ever done in my professional career. Same question for you, magic wand. What would you change about higher education? Uh, careful, I'm a dean. We're perfect. Okay. We're perfect. Can I we change non-Stanford? Sure. First question. What would you change non-Stanford? Uh, send more money. <laughs> Good. What would you change at Stanford? Uh, try and turn down the entrepreneurial buzz a little bit. So, you know, casinos, they pump in a high-pitched squeal in the background. So you think there's going to be a payoff. And at Stanford, it feels like that squeal is always being pumped in. And so I feel like people are kind of in a rush to make their mark. And uh, I'd, I'd like to turn that down a little bit. I don't think it's good for mental health. I don't think it's good for a breadth of learning. But, you know, this is, this is what people want to do. So, I don't Especially at this moment in time in the Valley, when and we've seen how the Valley's changed over the last several decades. And we're at the epicenter of it in Stanford. What I'd like to do is actually, I'm going to take some uh, questions from this, uh, our audience, if that's okay, Dan, and I'm going to call out. Let me start first on K-12. Kim Tong asked the question, um, does virtualizing K-12 through create fewer choices that meet the needs of children? Are you worried that if, if it all goes online, there's actually just a, a more narrow set of offerings for the students? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, you sort of saw it initially in the higher education space where there was sort of the MOOC, uh, you know, Coursera, edX, and they were all on the exact same model. There, you get a lecture and then you get a problem set. And uh, that really narrowed what education is. I have to say in the K-12 space, it's a different problem right now. It is, there is no dominant provider. And so there's an incredible amount of clutter. Teachers don't quite know what to use. Uh, districts are making choices based on, they have to make a decision. I probably get 10 emails a day from different people trying to say, I have this new application. You know, would you look at it and tell me it's great so we can use it in K-12? So right now, the, I think the concern is it's a cluttered market. And so it's very hard for people to make decisions about quality. Uh, if there was, in the end, you know, if we had a, a national curriculum and everybody had to use some version of a Google program, that might be a concern. But like I said, education's really decentralized in the U.S. And that's mostly a feature, you think, or a bug? Uh, I think it's a, it's a feature, but it's a bug when you hit a pandemic. Yeah. 
So uh, my apologies if I mispronounce this name, Jun Choi and Marina Lalikian asked a good question. What are some of the best ideas for developing the soft skills online? Some of the interpersonal things that we talked about earlier and for engaging students in the online classroom. Right, that, that's uh, what, what, it, what works the best. Uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, the challenge is mo most soft skills are learned in social interaction and through social model, right? So like math anxiety, uh, you learn math anxiety by watching someone you care about be anxious about math. So the, the challenge is, uh, it, can we orchestrate social interactions that develop these soft skills? And, and how you develop them is gonna vary by age. So, you know, for a young age, you want kids to play games. Uh, you want them to stay in the same role. If you're playing like doctor and nurse with them in like a little tea set or something, you want them to stay, no, you're still the doctor. And this is how you develop sort of the foundation of the soft skills. For older kids, most of the soft skills, you need to teach them that even though it takes longer, it's better. Almost all the soft skills are harder and more work, and they're not a direct solution. So how, how can you convey that? I think this is a, a profound research question. How do you help people make good choices without forcing them to be habitual? Oh, so Dan, does that mean that our sociology department and our humanities departments, those, they're teaching things that are harder than STEM? Uh, I don't know about sociology. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's all hard. I mean, it, you give me any topic and I can make it harder than quantum physics just by teaching it badly, you know? So, <laughs> um, so the soft skills is a good question. Right now, the best, I, I had a student actually who started a company to teach soft skills in a game, in a software game. It was really beautifully done. And he took a bunch of venture capital and what he didn't, they finally started making revenue. And what he didn't realize was the venture capitalists wanted him to sell or to go public. And he wasn't making enough revenue, so he had to pivot. So he's not teaching soft skills anymore. But you have to be just, careful about those slimy scum sucking VCs. I, I be very just, careful about them. He just didn't know. He didn't know <laughs> the deal he got into. But, or he, uh, should, he should have taken entrepreneurial finance with me. I would have taught him all that. <laughs> right. It's another person who goes out there and thinks they know something about a sector and thinks they can do it, just like education. <laughs> Is James asked a good question. Do you think this will force change to the teaching profession that will make it easier to attract top talent? You talked about capital coming in. Is it about money? I mean, when you talked about teaching being rewarding, you didn't talk about it from a financial perspective. You talked about it from a fulfillment perspective, an emotional perspective. How do you capture that? Right, so I think in some places, there is enough money to stay in the teaching profession. I think in the Bay Area, I don't know how you do it. Right? I just say it's not enough money to live here. And so ideally schools will develop housing for the teachers, just like Stanford does for the faculty. You know, so, so then, then the money becomes less, less important at the employee level. Uh, but you, know, you, you, you find ways to make the teaching experience satisfying and a living wage and you stay fresh. You don't get uh, bored and tired of it and worn down by the grind of day after day. <laughs> um, you know, this, this, I, I do have to say you know, that I hadn't thought of this, but that question made me think that there's a good chance that uh, the teaching model will turn into a tutoring model. Mm. So, so it's not, teachers teach, you know, like three hours a week. And so it's not the full classroom teacher who really is the king or queen of their environment. It's someone with a particular expertise who comes in and teaches a particular way, tries to get a quick social connection with the kids, perhaps through tutoring style. So, so it can really disrupt the, the whole labor market. All right, there's a great question here from Marshall Pang, and I don't know if you thought much about this, but how might the purpose of teachers and education change in a world of increased use of artificial intelligence and computing technology? Yeah, I, so um, right now, a lot of the artificial intelligence is trying to imitate teachers. Uh, I don't think that's how it's going to succeed. It's going to succeed by creating tools that provide a lot of feedback and augment teachers. 
So, so for example, uh, a GSE graduate is uh, a leader of a company where you can put a cell phone in the middle of the class. And at the end of the period, it'll tell you how much you, the teacher, talked versus how much the students talk. And, you know, when you're on a roll and you're teaching, you don't realize you just talk for 50 straight minutes. So this is useful. Or we have a faculty member in the GSE who has uh, programmed an algorithm that can be used in Google Glass that detects emotions in real time. So children who have spectrum disorders can use these glasses so they can see a face and it will label what the emotion is, right? So this is something we couldn't do before. It's not replacing the teacher, right? It's augmenting what the teacher can do now as the teacher tries to teach the child about emotion. There's a question from Elston Sam, who's uh, typing this in from Singapore. And he wants to know, do we have a role in improving, we at Stanford, the overall country's education standard, and in particular, helping poorer and rural areas? Yes. What is the school, Graduate School of Education? How do you attack this and, and try to address it? Uh, well, a tremendous amount. Uh, so we have lots of social justice warriors, right, who are really trying to think about both what is the nature of the problem such that it could be solved, and then what are the, uh, the people and the institutions that contribute to those problems? So, you know, a tremendous amount. We have people who are doing research in rural India about different solutions. So th this is a main focus of the School of Education is often how do we help those who depend most on an edu a good education and are least likely to get it? There's a question from uh, Fakhri Jir. My apologies if I mispronounce that. He wants to know, how can we measure and assess quality of learning outcomes in K through 12 if it's done remotely? Uh, so um, if you're thinking like a high stakes test, you know, uh, I think that's easy. You just, it's the same test it always was. You just find a way to make sure they can't cheat, right? And, and there's all sorts of things in place. Uh, if you're thinking about quality in terms of what are the skills and dispositions to be an independent learner, then we got to work on that. And it's something my lab actually works on. And uh, so uh, someday, if you get really, really interested, I can send you a very long and painful paper that discusses how we do this. I like long and painful papers. I hope you'll send it to me. <laughs> don't, don't but on, but on, the, on the first part of that question, I'm trying to like, keep that in mind and realize that the University of California just announced that they're not going to do standardized tests anymore because it disadvantages certain parts of our society. So wouldn't what you just proposed a some sort of standardized test to test knowledge, doesn't that just going to disadvantage certain parts of our society again? Uh, well, hopefully you can do it better. Right. So, you know, the SAT includes a lot of questions that you have to have taken certain kinds of classes. Right. Uh, I think college, colleges or graduate school is going to move away from the GRE. The, the, the trick is, can we find other source of information besides letters of recommendation? Right. That, and that's the same. I think the colleges can move away from the SAT because they know a lot about the schools where these kids are coming from so they can interpret their grades. But you know, there's, there's this other kind of stuff, like uh, to be certified as a teacher, you have to take a test. And, and you sort of want them to take a test to make sure they're qualified. There was a, another question here. It kind of goes back to one of the things that you mentioned, that somebody can come to Stanford and basically use it to search for a job. What do you think the role is of a higher education place like Stanford in helping to train the workforce and help them find jobs. Uh, you know, I had this discussion in one of my classes last quarter. Are we really just a job shop? And the difference is, at least to the Graduate School of Business, I'm hedge fund people and consultants and entrepreneurs, as opposed to plumbers and electricians, but I'm basically training them for jobs. How do you react to that assertion? So I, I, I don't find vocational education objectionable, right? This is something that was handed down from the Greek conception of liberal arts which is for very rich people to talk about how to make decisions around government. And the other people who had vocations didn't get to partake. So voc vocational education is okay by me. Telling the students, no, you shouldn't take computer science because it might get you a job. Seems like a kind of knuckleheaded thing to do. What, what you wanna do is make sure that 
they develop the sort of attitudes, the breadth, the things so that they can change jobs. So most of the students who get their degrees in computer science, after five years, they're managers. They're no, they're no longer coders. And so you sort of want to target that. But for us to say you shouldn't get a job, I mean, it used to be that every, all economics was the number one major, right? Now, now it's computer science and, 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 or pre-med, you know? So I, I think you're, you're, it's an unsuccessful battle to say you can't do that. The successful battle is how can you do that, but at the same time, make someone well-rounded. And to be honest with you, computer science and coding, that's gonna be the next skill to be automated and the machines are gonna take that over soon as well. So, you know, that's just only a question of when, not if, and how quickly that's going to happen. My God, it's Skynet. <laughs> exactly. When they become sentient, that's when we're all screwed. Um, there's a really good question here from Deborah Nelson. She wants to know is how do we discuss and share best practices and toolkits across the community as teachers? As a lot of people are going through, you know, we, we've done this, the, this quarter, the the, the spring quarter was done by fire. It was two weeks of not leaving this room that I'm in and it's basically 18 hour days and people on the faculty sharing best practices and notes. And now we're thinking about the fall where there's gonna be likely some blend of in-person uh, and, and, and virtual. How do we share those best practices and do it not only within Stanford, but even more broadly across our community? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And uh, part of the problem is we don't know if they're best practices. So there's, there's a tremendous, like I said, there's a tremendous amount of clutter. Uh, and you, it, w buried in that clutter is a great nugget, a great idea. You know, oh, use Google Sketch when they're in the participant rooms in Zoom so you can see what's going on because you can see it on the sketch pad, even if you're not in the room. Simple idea, really good. So, so how do we roll this up? You know, I think this is a good question. I think Stanford should have an educational grand rounds like they do in medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, where people and, and the people who care will come. You know, the people. All right, who, okay. I'm sorry. Last no. question for you. And then I'll let you and everybody else go have dinner and enjoy their evening. Um, how do you think admissions to places like Stanford are going to be impacted by this? You know, um, how are universities going to be thinking about students who, for at least four months and probably maybe even a couple of years, are going to have mm -hmm. their fundamental education process substantively disrupted. How is that going to impact the flow of students that come into places of higher learning? Oh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, all of us who are on the admission side are very aware of this, right, and of the disruption. And, you know, if a student has a bunch of passives instead of A pluses, we sort of know what that means. So, so the, the real challenge is what, what are other information sources we can have on whether this student would enjoy a place like this where the academic standards are quite high. You know, the la last thing I want to do is admit a student who the academic standards are too high for their preparation and they just have a miserable time. So that, that's going to be the challenge is can we get another source, other sources of information to help, help figure out given that uh, some of our direct measures have been disrupted. But, you know, to me, if a student is six, covered six months less of their K-12 curriculum, I don't think it's really going to hurt them that much if colleges are willing to say, it's okay, you can take calculus here. You don't have to have already taken three courses in calculus, so you can be a major in science. Dan, I want to take a moment to thank you on behalf of Dean Levin, uh, Professor Lowry, and all of us at the Graduate School of Business. Uh, this has been an unprecedented quarter uh, that none of us expected. Uh, and when I had the opportunity to reach out to you to talk about this, about business and society, which is going to become an increasingly more important part of our school at the university, uh, Dean Levin's going to talk about this tomorrow in this class with the students. Um, I am so grateful that you were willing to spend a little over an hour with us uh, so late in the evening. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you will take a moment and thank Dan for coming and joining with us. Uh, Bernadette, or Liz, is there anything else that we want to say before we sign off this evening? So you know why I agreed to do this? Why'd you agree to do it, Dan? Because education's about to be increasingly commercialized, mm -hmm. right? It's a for-profit is going to move in and I would like them to move in well. <laughs>